Hello and welcome to the audio version for the CAST 102 supports for all students. The agenda today, the first component is we're going to look at test accessibility resources for all students that is within the CAST test. As you see on the screen, the CAST began in 2017 and now we're in 2022 have it, having had a year of the test being canceled, the test being optional, and the first implementation results from 2019. So this year we are hoping um, to gain more traction in the scores so that we can at least get two years of scores so that the CAST scores for science can be placed on the dashboard next to math and ELA. So just a reminder that this test is a cumulative test. It is not just an eighth grade, a fifth grade, or a high school 11th and 12th grade student test. It is cumulative of all the standards in the band below when the test is given. So K-8 standards, 6-8 standards, and high school standards. So it's really the responsibility of all the educators in those grade levels and not just the fifth grade, eighth grade, or 11th and 12th grade science teachers. On the CAST, the structure, it has 30 to, 4, 30 to 40 discrete items that are computer scored, and then three to four performance tasks that are given. And notice some field test items are um, also given within the test. So the essential question for this recording is, can all students share their learning in science on the CASP? And what we have here is what is traditionally called a bento box of supports for students. As I'm talking, I'd like you to think for yourself which of these supports you believe your students will benefit from the most. What will they need? And the supports that we're looking at today are in this blue region at the top where it says available to all students. So CAST 102 is about resources that all students can have as supports. This is not 504 or IEP, which is below in green. These are for all students, and we're going to get more in depth into them in the next slide. So for all students, we have universal tools and designated supports. So these are universal tools that are embedded into the computer program on which your students will be taking the test. Notice they are all listed here. And if you click on the links, she will have um, access to the slide deck as well. It will have um, a video from CASP explaining those specific tools that students can use. We also have embedded designated supports. Again, designated is for all students. Um, these ones are a little bit more in depth. You can um, color contrast meaning instead of just a white background with black lettering, they have different colors to choose from if that helps students. You can also change the size and color of the pointer and you can have a text to speech option. There's translations for the video and also a dual language where it's Spanish and English. Um, note here that if any of these tools are at any time too much for any student and it's becoming a distraction for them, then any of these tools can also be turned off. And very, very important here at the bottom, any time a speech tool is used, and they are allowed for all students, please note that you should have headphones available for the students to use that tool with, so they are not a distraction to surrounding students. So non-embedded universal supports are breaks students can have and scratch paper that then is turned into the um, proctor at the end of the test. Non-embedded designated supports are amplification, calculator, magnification, noise buffers, read alouds for the questions, science charts. Notice I have highlighted scribe because that is the one that I'm going to be going into in more depth. Um, separate setting from the rest of the students if they get distracted too easily. Simplified test directions and or translated test directions. For more information on any of these, there is a link here down at the bottom that goes specifically into what that looks like on the CASP. What I'm gonna go into is embedded supports. These are built into the test. These can be turned on and off for individual students. 
and non-embedded supports that must be provided by the sites, specifically highlighting the scribe function that was in the last slide. And I believe these non-embedded supports that the sites must provide are the key to equity and access to students showing their knowledge in science on the test. So what is the scribe feature? It literally student dictates responses to a human who records verbatim what is dictated. And this only occurs in segment three through six. So segment three, some students will be given more multiple choice items and some students will be given a performance task. It is where you see performance task that students can then respond verbally and a scribe can write down exactly what they're saying. So think of what students you have that would benefit from that support of having a scribe. Scribe features, these can be used for all students on performance tasks, items three to six, the sections of the test. Scribes must be trained and documented by the charter. So I have a link here for that protocol document. It's a document they must read through to ensure that they understand how to be a scribe. And then a piece of paper at the site provided by the principal or admin stating that um, the person who read that and understands and is familiar with the CASP test signs off stating that they have read and understood how to be a scribe. Also, they need to sign a TOMS non-test administer, administrator agreement. There's the link to that there. And this is common practice um, by LEAs generally at all testing sites for all teachers or individuals that come in contact with students during testing. When students reach section three, they will go to the scribe who will write their verbal response to the performance task on the document. Logistics will include how scribe and student can work together, not be heard by other test takers, and complete sections three through six on the test. It's important to note that students receiving scribe support must be designated by the LEA in the TOM system at least 48 hours before the test is opened up. Sites will need to identify all students who will need scribe supports. Scribe supports are given and recommended for all students, but this is not part of an IEP or accommodations. So a sample of site logistics. This is a site in um, LA who is choosing to train three aides and two science teachers as scribes which means that they are familiar with the CASP testing videos that the LEA can share um, through Moodle or they've proctored or done a CASP test before. And they've also read the protocol document and signed that they have read it and understand what they are supposed to do as a scribe. At this specific site, they have chosen their gym and they've set it up with five testing stations out of earshot from one another. And the students rotate through the open scribe stations each day for each segment. So they've taken one week as their testing window for science. Day one, all students complete sections one and two, the whole class, and this is the multiple choice component of the test. Day two, students who receive a performance task on segment three, take their computer, go to the gym, and they wait for an open scribe to be able to scribe for them that specific performance task. They end with segment three. The next day, segment four, the students will then go to the gym and wait for a scribe to open. We have five scribes and that scribe will then write down their response to segment four performance task. We do the same thing on day four, which is Thursday and day five, which is Friday. And what that enables the students to have is the test um, given over the entire week. So it's just one segment at the end per day and scribes are able to be there then to write down what the student is saying for that segment. The, this is determined by this specific site and what worked for this site. So meet with your admin, or if you are with the admin, meet with your team to decide what plan would work best for your site if you intend on offering the scribe feature. How will you know which supports your students will need? So um, familiarity. If, you can't do better until you know better, a famous um, Oprah quote. So what we're going to do here is we have an option for a scavenger hunt because there's two components here. One is the students need to be familiar with the technology that is on the CASP test. So we have a scavenger hunt that runs through the tech 
on it and they try to find all the different supports. And the other one, of course, would be the scribe option. So at the end of the scavenger hunt that we're going to provide you if you want to run that for your students, there is also a Google survey form where it lists all of the options, the supports that can be given to them, and then they choose the ones that they feel would best support them showing their science learning. So once you have that, then the site can decide logistically what the plans are to support the students on the test. Here are the links to the fifth and the eighth grade um, scavenger hunt. It shows them how to access it, where to click. And then at the very bottom here is the scavenger hunt. So I can access the calculator and show my peers how to use it. I can remove any highlighting. I, I can hear the questions being read out loud. So they go through in teams in the classroom and the team that gets through all 18 first raises their hand and then they share their responses with the class to prove that they did go through all the scavenger hunt questions correctly. Whatever prize the site determines for that is um, entirely up to the site. This is just one option to get them familiar with the technology. And if you look here at the end of the survey, there is a Google form. This was the form I was referring to that provides them with some of the supports that are available to them, asks what else they might need, and they can then submit that back to their teacher or to the admin on the site. So we have a better idea of what the students feel they need as supports for the test. So we're going to end here. The CAS practiced and training test, here is a link specifically to those and how to um, start the test and some scoring guides. I would recommend that once they're used to the technology that you use the same groups and have the teacher go through a couple of the questions on the um, practice tests and training tests, have students respond, hold up a whiteboard or share the response. The groups that get the response correct get points. Um, if a group gets it correct, they have to share out their thinking to the class around why they believe it to be correct and it goes on to the next question. I'd recommend doing the training test and not the practice test because the training test does not have solutions. So that way you can provide the solutions with the students as you go through it with them. The practice tests are something that they can do on their own because there is um, solutions in terms of the scoring guides here. We recommend if you are doing high school or eighth grade to start with the fifth grade tests to help build their confidence and then move up to the grade level that you're at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Brian Foley. Um, now we're going to take a look inside the cast uh, questions, take a look at some of the question types um, and what sorts of things our students need to be ready to do in order to be successful on the cast. Uh, as you remember from the CAST 101 video, we did a breakdown of the different types of questions on the test, different uh, question content. Uh, we talked about how each question item is going to probe at least two of the NGSS dimensions. Uh, that means there's plenty of questions about science and engineering practices and cross cutting concepts. Um, and so let's take a look at how they're uh, forming the questions and how the scoring works on the ones that are th not going to be machine scored uh, so that we can get our students ready uh, to take the test and be prepared for what they're going to see. The different types of questions that the cast has includes um, multiple choice, of course, uh, but there are mul several types of multiple choice, including, you know, drop down menus, uh, ones where you answer multiple true false uh, questions and those sorts of things. Um, there's also questions where you need to drag uh, a, a word or a picture into some place. Um, there's some uh, where you have to fill in a spot in a picture or and of course you have to type answers um, sometimes the instead of typing an answer you're filling in numbers on a keypad uh, and then uh, there are the sort of short answer uh, questions where they have to construct uh, some written uh, response to a prompt um, so those are the sort of the, the types of questions we're going to be looking at uh, let's take a look at an example here. Um, in this one, you know, this is uh, just the first part of the question. Uh, in this one, uh, the students are supposed to look at a graph. 
and make some determinations about uh, animal populations. Um, in this case, the graph changes depending on the pull-down menu, uh, and so they can see different uh, different versions of the graph and use that in their reasoning. And then they're asked to um, respond to that by filling in uh, the this table um, just by saying whether each of the organisms is going to increase or decrease or remain steady. So they would then take uh, these boxes and drag them up into the appropriate place. Not not the most complicated of questions, but uh, something we need our students to be familiar with so they're not surprised, so they don't get flustered while they're taking the test. So they you want them to be um, familiar with the types of questions that are on the cast. Um, a different type of question uh, is this one with the graphs of uh, velocity um, and kinetic energy. Um, in this one, you have to actually move the the um, the bar the bar graph. Uh, you can click on car number five and set the height of the bar graph to the appropriate height, and you can type in the calculated result. Uh, here's a simple uh, example of a multiple choice question. Uh, quite simple, and you know. Uh, You've probably talked to your students about uh, answering multiple choice questions and the different strategies um, in terms of being able to eliminate wrong answers uh, and to uh, pick the best answer and not, of course, leave anything blank. Cool. Uh, again, another multiple choice question. Uh, in this case, just I wanted to highlight uh, the types of things that they're asking for in here. Uh, as we mentioned, there are a lot of questions about science and engineering practices. Um, in this case, they're asking students, um, how would you create, given a scenario, how would you create an experiment uh, in order to test it, and what are the materials you'd need for your experiment? Um, this is a type of uh, thinking that students uh, may not be as familiar with, so you want to make sure uh, that they've thought through some of these kinds of issues. And, of course, knowing what some of these uh, uh, types of, of objects are you know we've been online for a while we haven't done a lot of in-person labs so they might not be as familiar with some of these tools um, here's another one of the release questions this is a constructed response question uh, based on uh, a, sen a phenomenon uh, and a graph uh, showing population over time uh, and the uh, question asks students to explain um, what's going on at two points in the graph. We have point A here where the graph is rising rapidly and point B where the graph is pretty much stable. Um, and it says explain why the paramecium population is rapid at the part labeled A and why the population growth is slower at the part labeled B. Right. So that is the that is the prompt and let's take a look at some of the uh, rubrics for this and how it gets scored. Um, so the performance tasks uh, are similar to the um, of the the short response tasks, uh, except uh, it's going to be a multi-question sequence based on a single phenomenon. Uh, you're going to have uh, some information and uh, the questions on the page. They tend to split the screen. I'll t show you an example in a minute. Um, and at least one question in each performance task is going to require a written response, like we just saw. Um, so here's one of the performance tasks involving populations of thistles. Um, there are six questions related to this particular phenomenon. Uh, we have a uh, sort of a graphic, a model perhaps, uh, at the bottom, and this changes over time so you can see uh, what's going on with the populations at different times. And then on the right side of the screen you see the questions. We've got some multiple choice uh, drop-down questions here and a multiple choice question uh, about um, what will likely happen in the future. Uh, and then on the next page, um, they've given some more information about some insects related to the thistles and some questions, including a constructed response question. With these performance tasks, you are able to go back and forth between pages so you can take a look at what was on the previous page. Uh, students should know that they're able to do this um, and be able to um, get all the information they need to answer the questions. Cool. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, the rubrics. Um, so uh, all of the the questions are computer scored, with the exception of the uh, the essays or the constructed responses, um, and those are scored um, based on two a two point rubric. Um, so for example, uh, and oh, and uh, all this information is located in the uh, practice guide and the scoring um, documents that we linked earlier. I'll, I'll link those again at the end here so you can see that. Um, practice item six um, is the uh, paramecium question we looked at before. Um, as you can see, they give some information about what are the things that are being assessed in this question. It's uh, the SEP for analyzing and interpreting data. Um, it's a cause and effect uh, cross-cutting concept, and so you can see what they're looking for here. Uh, let's take a look at the rubrics that they provide. Um, so the, the rubric is that they need to include information about point A, that resources are plentiful so the population can grow, and in point B, that the resources are limited uh, or and uh, something about carrying capacity um, so that the growth rate is slower, right? And they give you an example. Um, the example here is that at point A, the paramecium population is growing rapidly because there's plenty of food. At point B, growth rate slows down because the food supply is limited. So those are the key ideas, and you need both of those to get two points. So let's take a look at some other examples of this. Um, so here we have example A and example B. In example A, it says it's growing rapidly at part A because there's abundant resources, but when it reaches its carrying capacity, it slows down. Now, the example A here does not mention part B specifically, but it does describe it as slowing down. Uh, and so that was a two point uh, score on that one. Now, in example B, it says at point A, the population experiences a period of legit logistic growth, so a little um, language issue there. Uh, I think they meant logarithmic. Uh, population will increase rapidly because there's nothing stopping them. They have abundant resources, so they got the point A idea there. If population starts to slow and it reaches carry capacity at point B and will stay at a steady rate. Population experience logistic growth just like most populations do at some point in their existence. Uh, interesting. Now, what's missing there? Um, there's no mention uh, that point B that there's a limit in uh, resources, right? So we're missing that point in example B, even though they did say a lot of nice things. Uh, this is going to be a one-point score. Cool. Uh, a couple more examples. Uh, in example C, population is rapid because paramecians are reproducing. Uh, then it hits carrying capacity and then it will stay the same. Example C, uh, they don't mention uh, the part A or part B uh, specifically, uh, and so although they do describe it a little bit, they're not responding to the prompt, and so that is a zero point score uh, for example C. And then in example D, uh, the population increases. Uh, in part B, the population is Resources carrying capacity mean there's only enough resources in the environment to support a certain population of the resource, and the resources can't sustain the paramecium. So they did a good job in explaining Part B. They did not say anything about in par Part A uh, and how their resources are plentiful. So again, you're missing that one part uh, in Part A. So that gives you a pretty good sense. I think the rubrics are fairly straightforward, um, and um, just so, uh, of course, the key for the students is to make sure they're responding to all parts of the prompt, uh, to make sure that they're explaining their thinking clearly, uh, and then they're not leaving things out. They're not sort of assuming everybody knows that it's because of resources or something like that. They've got to really be articulate, uh, and they're going to need some practice in doing that and some feedback for sure. Cool. Uh, all right, so the documents that we were looking at today, um, the, of course, the practice tests uh, that we've talked about in all of these guides, um, and then the uh, scoring guide. Uh, there's a scoring guide for the fifth grade, the eighth grade, and the high school tests. Uh, and that includes the rubrics and those samples uh, that we looked at are all provided in that scoring guide. All right, uh, thanks very much. In uh, CAST 103, we'll look at 
uh, ways to help students practice and get ready for uh, taking these tests. Um, what are some examples and some ways to find some good uh, uh, practice uh, materials? Thanks very much.